we're good to go. Hello, Thrive Nation. I've got a movement specialist. He's a human performance presenter, worldwide division one strength and conditioning coach, a Cambo facilitator, facilitator, greater, incredible digital program, a kettlebell lifestyle. Um, you know, these are just some of the accreditations and certifications of Mike Salemi. And it's a privilege to have him on. He's been on some of the most favorite podcasts, the Ben Greenfield show and Josh Trent's wellness radio show. So it's a real honor to have a movement specialist um, on the Made to Thrive show. So welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, Steve. Happy to be here, brother. Thank you so much for having me. Brilliant. Now, I love you've got a me. Movement is medicine, and uh, there's an emotional, mental, psychological, physical aspect to, to movement. So I want to jump right in and start with that meme before we get into the kettlebell lifestyle and kettlebells and why kettlebells. How is movement medicine? Well, movement is life. I mean, that's the truest sense of the word. It's like the, I've heard this many times before, but the only difference between a living person and a dead person is movement, <laughs> right? And so at, at, at the most fundamental level, like when we stop moving, we stop living. We stop pumping the body. We stop moving our thoughts. We stop moving our emotion. And so for me, movement, absolutely. Like the most um, obvious form of movement that people think of is physical movement. But yeah. I think opening up our lens to these other forms of movement. I mean, if anyone's heard, uh, emotions are energy in motion. And what's one of the worst, like for me at least, one of the worst feelings in the world is the feeling of being stuck, is the feeling of being stagnant. And so one of the things that I've learned with movement as medicine, it's like, as we move our physical body, so does everything else. And especially when we bring a level of intentionality for why we're moving or why we're doing what we're doing, and we integrate that with the breath because the breath is absolutely key. It is the um, inspiration is how we inspirit ourselves, right? So if you think about that, integrating breath with movement, bringing an intentionality component, movement absolutely is medicine. Brilliant. And let's talk about self-awareness. I do want to go into breath work. I want to go into intentionality. You know, I did a huge functional, uh, you know, strength class this morning. And every time I picked up the weight or picked up the kettlebell, I thought of you being intentional <laughs> about how I'm picking it up. You know, just my mind, my emotions, my breath, my posture, my alignment. So let's talk about sort of your body awareness and how should people start before they even start exercising? You know, I've been exercising, I don't know, my whole life, run 11 comrades marathons, which is a huge, you know, long distance race, 56 miles, done 11 in a row, then 27,000 kilometers on the road in the last 40 years. Uh, so training seven days a week, sometimes even twice a day. But I've learned something from you about this intentionality and body awareness. Could you unpack like body awareness and how important that is when people are exercising? It's such a good, such a good question. So I really do believe the session starts well before so many of us even think it starts. It's like, uh, when does digestion happen? Does it happen when you actually eat the food or does it happen when you actually have the food in front of you and you start salivating or when you actually bought the food or where did the food come? Did you hunt the food? So it's like a lot of times when we think about nutrition and eating, we just think about what we're just putting in. Same thing with training. When you, before you even step in the gym, like I really do believe training is happening all day, but we only categorize this 60 minute block of when that movement practice happens. So body awareness, even just simply how we carry ourselves, how are we sitting in our chair? How are we walking? How are we going about our day? All of those things. And this is why I'm such a huge proponent of warming up outside of even just the benefits of warming up the tissue, warming up the joints. Just simply the act of intentionally being in the gym, adjusting our posture and creating these smaller levels of micro movement awareness. Those are the things I found that I have to do so much less coaching in the gym. If I focus on all these things, these little minute things that everyone are oftentimes gets overlooked, those are the things that really pay dividends. And for example, if someone is in a bad position, lifting a deadlift off the floor or a kettlebell deadlift. You could certainly give them cues and options, but if they don't have the awareness that even their back is rounding or their shoulders are rounding forward, they don't even have the context. They don't even have the language in their head, the vocabulary to know something's wrong and what do I do to adjust it? 
And that's why everything that we do beforehand matters so much. And one of the things that I love what you said is like when you approach the gym or when you were in the gym, you were thinking about the approach. Now, this was something that I really learned in competitive powerlifting, that what I did in the moments before and my mindset and my intensity and my intentionality with when I grabbed, I would always go like left foot first, then right foot first. Then I would grab my left hand, then my right hand, then pull myself underneath the bar and then get my abs nice and tight. Like it was basically like a checklist of automatic functions that I had just trained in my body. And that ritual became how I started basically approaching every single lift or everything, especially with intentionality in my life to get that much more. And it's like, what's the most important part of any lift? Some people will say the lift itself. I believe every part's important, but the setup, how you approach and how you set your feet, how you set your hands, if that's messed up, it will have a cascade effect in everything afterwards. Sure. Brilliant. What a, what a summary. Now, there's so much noise in our world in per- terms of what people are thinking, the distractions, the obviously devices. You know, I've got a 17-year-old son. How do, we, how do we cut, you know, put the boundaries in place? You know, I, I think it's really important because intention can't be distracted. You've got to be focused, you know, and you've got to obviously, what is your like pre-routine? The pre-routine sets up your intention so that when you approach the weight, you're in this pre-routine, this habitual ritual that helps you be intentional and then lift correctly. So for someone who's never exercised, or even my son who's done a lot of functional strength training, a lot of exercise, a lot of cardio, provincial, or you know, tennis player, how do you teach that from the basics? Because it seems that that would be the most important and then together with the breath next, or I suppose your thought becomes before your breath, maybe you can take us through a sort of a structured process. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I was just thinking when you were saying, how old's your son again? He's 17. Uh, 17. Okay. All right. So he's a good age. So like, I've learned so much training kids uh, over the years. And I feel like anybody who works with kids, like God bless you, Mm. it is full on. And if you can teach kids, like you can really teach anybody, honestly. Mm. But one of the things that I learned with teaching kids is it's so important at any level to create the container, to create the container, to set basically, as soon as they come in, it's going to be fun. Like you got, like for me, I realized like you have to play with kids, you teach through play. Right. And so you can do so much by setting some ground rules, letting people know, like when they're there, this is the container of where we're going to play, but we're also going to work. And so a lot of times I'll, um, uh, like hide certain aspects of what I'm trying to do through play. So one example would be if I'm trying to get people in the, these kids in the container of getting them to breathe properly and stuff like that, what I'll have them do is I'll have them take a sip of water. They'll hold the water in their mouth. One that forces them not to talk, right? So they're (laughs) going to be less distracted by their friends, right? So that's one thing because you're exactly right. Distractions are one of the the biggest things that we need to subdue and quell if we want to get ahead, whether it's in our workouts and life. And so when the kids have the water in the mouth, they're not talking. They're more present. The other thing that it's going to do, it's going to focus them on nasal breathing. So all the benefits of nasal breathing, them focusing on their breath, staying more down, regulated, more calmer, so they can listen to my cues, be more present with my cues. Also, all the benefits of conditioning. So that's one small example of how you can start creating a container to get a lot of what you, you know, what you're trying to get out of it with, with less work. Um, in terms of maybe like my routine before I get into the gym. So again, this goes with setting the container. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of music. I'm like very, like, I love hearing my breath when I'm training. I love hearing my own grunts when I'm training. I love feeling and, and sometimes music can be, you know, very helpful, but what I found over the years is for me, it's, it's distracting. And that's going to be very unique to the individual. If it music supports you go for it. But for me, I like my training to be like the church. Like I love it to be quiet and I love training in my garage. Um, you know, I, I actually like the lights fair on the dimmer side. I love just to like feel like I'm going into a cave. And so I create an environment for me that's very conducive with being as present as possible with what I'm doing. I go through my warm up sequence. And then again, I just like 
my workouts don't take ex exceptionally long, but there's always a methodical process to get me into that state of ready and willing to, to crush it. Brilliant. That's incredible sort of signpost, some water being intentional, you know, being absolutely focused on what you're doing. Tell us a little bit about your record. I mean, people might not know Mike Salemi. You're a world record holder in kettlebells, powerlifting. You've obviously, you know, paid your dues for many, many years and things have dramatically changed because I know that you had a long history of injuries as well, which you've now overcome, worked with Paul Check and, and so forth. But what have you learned over the years and just give, you know, the audience a little bit of your sort of accolades in the powerlifting and kettlebell stage? Yeah, my when I was at like my height in uh, in powerlifting and through drug free lifting and drug free organizations, I was doing. Um, so in kilos, I'm not quite sure the exact conversion, but in pounds, it was 605 pounds on the squat, 615 on the deadlift, and then uh, 470 on the bench press. And those are all for one repetition. And that was at 19 at 178 pounds of body weight. Wow. And so I was very avid in competing, um, was fortunate enough to travel the West side barbell trained under Louis Simmons for about a month. And so much of his coaching philosophy has just impacted not only when I was powerlifting, but I mean, even to this day. Uh, so I was very involved in powerlifting and then in kettlebell sport, I competed for over 10 years or about 10 years and uh, reached the rank of master of sport, which is kind of like a black belt level, you can say, in the sport, in two of the, the, the most common or the most like quintessential categories. And so for those who may not be aware, essentially what I would do is I would lift 232 kilogram kettlebells, 72-ish pounds in each hand, and we would clean and jerk them. So bring to the chest and then overhead and repeat that as many times as possible without stopping in 10 minutes. Um, and then the other event that I would compete in was 232 kilos repetitive jerk. So from the chest to an overhead lockout, 10 minutes followed by a 10 minute, 32 kilo snatch with one hand switch. Mm. So I was able to reach kind of the black belt level. And that was one of the few Americans to ever do so in both categories and then win in one organization, a world championship. Mm. So it's definitely been, uh, it, it's been a long journey through, like you said, a lot of injuries, a lot of, you know, different coaches learning different styles and methods. But I think at the end of the day, the, the biggest lesson for me is like, truly the body is a system of systems, right? And if we only treat the physical body as a physical compartmentalized thing, we miss so much of the puzzle. And once I really started truly enjoying my lifting at a much deeper level, I started realizing that as my physical performance goes, so is my mental, so is my emotional, and so is my spiritual development too. If I'm focusing on that big piece that we were talking about, which is the intentionality, yeah. there is no failures anymore. It's basically wins and lessons. And if we can look at it from that perspective and continually be humble and curious, then we continually move forward, whether it's in our own career or now my main motivation is to teach and to share others so that they can hopefully learn something of value that, that I had learned in the past. So um, it's way more about than just sets and reps, way more about the number that's on the bar. Uh, that's only one small aspect of how I look at performance today. And do you think your performance would have dramatically increased had you known now what you know then in terms of like maybe a 30% <laughs> increase or, you know, recovery, you know, you, you want that experience and that wisdom, or maybe Paul Check was in your life when you were 20 breaking records or world champ, what would have happened to your performance? Man, that, so I get part of me wants to say, yes, I wish I knew then what I do now. Cause I think that's all of us, but you know, like, the more that I really feel into it and I've thought about this is like, I don't know if that's true because like, man, there was so many, like some of the most memorable moments in our life are those that are traumatic, whether it's, you know, and there's two types of trauma, there's big T trauma, there's little T trauma. But like, I remember going through my version of very traumatic experiences, trying so many times getting injured literally not knowing who the hell I was, if I wasn't an athlete, having to take a year off, having fungal and parasite issues. So all of these like tough experiences, they hardened the hell out of me. And they really reinvigorated why I was doing what I was doing, why I wasn't going to give up. And so if I would have known, you know, and been able to resolve my compartment syndrome or like a pinched nerve in my back, one, I would not have met the people that I would have met. 
because I went out seeking. That's why I went to go see Paul was because no one could figure out why the hell I had this issue in my arm where my arm would just blow up, swell with blood. I'd lose all feeling. So if I knew that that was the issue, but I didn't go to necessarily see Paul, man, so much of my worldview, my training philosophy, how I care for myself today, how I teach my programs, uh, literally it was like an internship. So uh, I don't know if I would change it. I don't think I would change it, but part of me wishes like it didn't have to be so hard uh, in some respects, but you know, I'm grateful for it. Yeah. But give us a number. I'm going to press you here a little bit, Mark. Maybe yeah, yeah. a 10% or 20% improvement if you knew what you oh. knew now. Maybe 30% <laughs> improvement. Well, I'll, I'll give you just one example. Um, when I learned how to actually train my feet, like actually started, I took some courses in barefoot rehabilitation, a few of those courses, and started really understanding and getting out of shoes and what those could do. Literally, when I was competing in biathlon, which is that 20 minute event, 10 minutes of the jerks, and then 10 minutes of the snatch. Once I started training my feet, and actually getting my big toe to work, which was wild. Mm -hmm. uh, I had something like an 18 repetition increase, which is way mm -hmm. more than 30%. So on the snatch, so just look at just that one element of something that I learned just towards the very, very end, probably the last six months of my competitive career was about five plus years ago. I learned that one element. And when you're an elite level lifter, literally like 1% is huge. If you're a novice lifter, it's like, literally I could throw anything at a kid, relatively speaking, and they'll grow and they'll improve if it's someone's first time in the gym. But you know, I mean, you've been doing this for so long, right? Like if you get a micro improvement in a year, as long as you don't go down, it's a huge yeah. win. Even if you stay the same, sometimes it can be a huge win. Yeah. So, I mean, just getting my foot to work, I got well over a 30% increase on that one lift with, with just that. So, I mean, I would say conservatively across the board, probably 20%. Wow. I think, I think 15% would be a very conservative bet. 20, 20, 20 to 25. Sure. Uh, That's incredible. I wouldn't doubt that. I do want to get into kettlebells, Mark, but I'm so interested. You know, my other life as a physician, I'm a physical therapist and a physician oh, wow. as a doctor of Chinese medicine, lectured to over 10,000 medical professionals, you know, in the neuromusculoskeletal space. But tell us quickly, maybe in two, a few minutes, how you trained your feet, how you got your big toe working, because I think this is <laughs> fundamentally important, you know, with regards to obviously stability, obviously alignment, you know, the anatomy trains and that, how important obviously it was, but what did you do to train your big toe? Yeah, such a good question. That's awesome. So never get asked that question. Uh, and so two things came up. Well, one, actually three things. One was just the awareness. So one, getting out of shoes and even doing my warm, even if I was competing with Olympic weightlifting shoes, I would do my warm up barefoot. So just doing some aspect and depending on the phase of training, if it wasn't in like a competition phase, oftentimes all my training and especially everything outside of my main kettlebell sports sets. So all my assistant exercises, my supplemental exercises, those were all done barefoot. So the awareness that I wasn't even using my toe incorporating it in warmups and then in different aspects that I could incorporate it in. I also got some toe spacers and uh, there was one, I tried two brands. One was called Correct Toes and then another one I don't recall, maybe it was just called the Toe Spacer. And that was really good to actually spread my toes apart because my pinky toe, especially in my last, actually my last two or three toes were literally just like folded underneath each other. They never actually had that like that awareness that they weren't even working. So the toe spacers was really helpful. And then the, my main teacher on barefoot education was a gal named Dr. Emily Spleekel. And she was on Ben Greenfield's podcast. Um, and so she's who I took the courses from. She's got an exercise. Anybody could look it up on YouTube. It's called short foot. And basically it's an activation exercise of the arch um, that exercise. And then the final one was actually just getting a rope, like, a like a half inch rope that was like six feet long, place that on the ground. And basically what I would do is I would place it in the space between my big toe and my second toe and basically like crank it all the way up, like walk my feet up and down or all the way down the rope or up the rope. And then I would put it in the other two toes 
and basically crunch it all the way up and then basically hit every single toe. So those sure. are probably the four biggest things that started retraining it. Sure. And made such a significant impact. So we've got to possibly do a foot and toe show. Maybe I can get the details of that physician to uh, get them on the podcast. That would be absolutely incredible. But she's, let's... she's awesome. You'll love. Yeah, she's she's a wealth of knowledge. She's super good. You'll love her. Fantastic. But let's talk about the kettlebell, why the kettlebell, not an ordinary weight and how important the kettlebell swing is. Absolutely. So, I mean, when you look at most people in the gym today, kettlebells are almost in every single gym. And I would argue to say that in most people's home gym, people, if they don't have a kettlebell, they've either seen one or considering Mm. it today. It's very, I would say in certain circles, still unknown, but for the vast majority of the fitness industry, kettlebells are really well Mm. known. And when you look at some of the benefits of a kettlebell versus a barbell, barbells are absolutely great, but typically someone is going to condition, or I'm going to utilize a barbell when I'm looking to maximize absolute strength, because I can incrementally load the bar heavier and heavier and heavier it lends itself well to more maximal strength training. The kettlebell is very different. The kettlebell is going to be more unilateral training. It's going to amplify any imbalances you have. Also due to the construction, you can do certain things with a kettlebell that you simply can't do with a barbell. So you mentioned the kettlebell swing. You can't swing a barbell basically back behind your legs, right? You'll just doesn't work like that. Mm. Also barbells take a lot of room. So from the portability, the versatility of a kettlebell, a kettlebell, basically when it's, when you're doing the snatch or when you're doing a bottoms up press, for those who aren't familiar, a bottoms up press, you're basically squeezing the kettlebell handle and the kettlebell's balancing upside down. When you're doing that, every single muscle is on the job. You are fully present. Try to be distracted when you're doing a bottoms up press and just watch what happens. Pretty painful. Uh, And so you have to be fully present. Your grip is on, your shoulders is on, your core is on. Every single muscle group is on the job. And so what I find is it's a way more integrative way to train. And also too, with literally one kettlebell, you have a whole gym. If you know what weight to choose, one, two, or max three bells, anybody, and that's what the main basis of my programs are, especially kettlebell lifestyle, is if you could only invest in one bell, one to two max, you can do and get a phenomenal training effect. So it's a versatile tool and also too, it's a nostalgic tool. Like, you know, I think it, it for me, at least when I first saw it, I was like, made me feel just uh, more like a warrior. Like it made me tap into mm. an identity that I wanted to bring out and express when I trained. And so for me, it was like, I was tapping into something ancient, which I really enjoyed. Brilliant. So I got an incredible story of listening to Joe DeSena and I carrying my kettlebell, my 16 kg kettlebell around wherever I went, where I went to the shops, where I went to the office <laughs> and I'd call it Sparta. And it was just such an incredible reminder that Sparta was coming with me. And, you know, it's so fascinating when you've got to carry this around, you've got to watch your posture. You can't just lean in the car and pick it up. These, these little awkward micro movements that you've got to be really aware of when you've got parcels, you're carrying Sparta the whole time. And it was such an amazing tool to carry around in terms of its versatility, you know, wherever you go, whether you travel, where you go to the office or where you go to the shops it can be used in such unique spaces Uh, tell us a bit about the history who started with the kettlebell where did it come from i mean i don't know i've got kettlebells here in my home gym i you know when i do functional training i've got it obviously at the gym it's part of my routine but how did it you know where did it come from and how did it develop so i've heard multiple different like origin stories of the kettlebell so i'll give you a few but i'm honestly not absolutely sure what's the real one uh and so We'll first start like in Russia, kettlebells were used in in older time, Russia kettlebells were used via system of weights and measures. And so let's say when they were measuring like in old school scales, they would put grains on one side and they would use kettlebells to basically balance out the weight of the grains. Uh, I've also heard stories, you know, plenty of video or um, pictures and read up on strongman using kettlebells for training, but actually even older back, like the oldest story that I had heard personally was actually Chinese monks basically using um, the locks on their temple on temple doors that basically looked like this square or rectangular lock and it would have a bar going across and they would use that for strength and conditioning training. 
So I'm honestly not sure what the the real story is or where it started, but I know we attribute a lot of it to Russia and like basically the form of training. I mean, Giryavoy sport, which is kettlebell sport in Russian, that is the national sport of Russia that wow. very few people, they don't even know that. When I was in Russia training, uh, we went to the national like strength museum and it was so cool. You just saw all these very old pictures of, of them lifting. So it means a lot in that country, even though like in the United States or maybe in some parts of the world, we have no idea what it is. Brilliant. Thanks for that. And now tell us about the kettlebell lifestyle program. Can anyone do it? Obviously people have heard about kettlebells and they're saying, okay, obviously Mark is this world champ. He's worked with like so many mentors. I mean, we haven't got into the space of all these incredible people that you've worked with that have helped you, but you know, why should they do the program and is it for everyone? Yeah. So I think a lot of people who maybe just maybe hear about what I've done in, in kettlebell sport or in powerlifting think it's like a, a program for world champions. Uh, it's absolutely not. It's not that like, and that's why, you know, it has all the principles that like we were talking earlier that I wish I knew when I was training, but it's a very, very uh, methodical periodized, basically phase by phase program. And oftentimes people think it's a lot slower. It's not an ass kicker program. This is not cross like a crazy CrossFit program. This is not a hundred swings a day. This is for, there's a whole beginner track. There's an intermediate track. The first three weeks are actually, they move very slow and they focus a lot on the warm up routine, which is like, I give a few different ones, but 18 minutes long. There's active meditation in it. There's morning routines with breath work. Those aspects as just a sample for me are as important, if not more important than the actual kettlebell workouts. So it's a very gradual program. And it's for two different levels. All you need is one, even two kettlebells. I also guide you through which bells through a questionnaire of which bells to select. There's a corrective stretching program that you go through. It's incredibly, incredibly thorough. And once you get past the first three weeks, actually on week two, I'm sorry, before you do any workout, you fill out five questions that look at stress and sleep, motivation level, even gut inflammation. And your volume of your training modifies slightly based off of how you're feeling. Because one of the things that I really wanted to do when I created a program was to make it, I wanted freedom within structure. And so I wanted to give people the structure. You can see the whole video guided along workout. I'm coaching every workout for you. But if you're super stressed and not sleeping and, and not really taking care of yourself, it's going to basically potentially recommend just do your flexibility work. Just do your active meditation. Cut down your sets by 50% once you see the program design sheet. So it's really a program that moves basically in conjunction with how well people are taking care of themselves. And so it's really the next closest thing that someone could get to working with me directly. And it's more than anything, it's a longevity and skill development program. Once someone goes through it, especially like phase three, when you get to the end, you've essentially laid such a deep foundation that you could do fucking anything that you want almost with kettlebells and phase three, even phase two is really challenging. Those are more of the performance phase, but you have, I'm a big believer. You have to earn your way into a lot of this stuff. People just pick up a weight and think, Oh, the kettlebell swing is the best exercise in the world. I'm going to go do it. But you literally can't even like sit down on a chair without basically collapsing your spine. You don't have the, aware like you've got to play, you got to pay some, some dues in the beginning. But if you do that, and if you do that in a just honestly a sensible way, an intentional way, by the time you get to week three to week five or week five to week nine, man, your learning curve goes, boom, shoots through the roof. And I'm confident that by the time someone goes through the program, they could almost do whatever they want with a kettlebell and feel good with it and know how to support themselves far beyond just, just good kettlebell movements. So that's kind of an overall view of the program. Um, took me, I think it was almost 10 months to create because we built it on a custom platform, basically, where it could be intuitive, like I was sharing, mm. but it's as much lifestyle as it is kettlebell lifting. Brilliant. And is this for geriatrics or teenagers, adolescents? I mean, what are the ranges in terms of ages that could actually adopt the program? I mean, I've got people from, I mean, I've got, uh, people in their, I mean, at least 
I think the oldest person that I recall giving me feedback was like 65, almost like high sixties. And then certainly kids, I've got dads doing it with their sons. But what I will say is you could do the whole program, but the main thing is that you choose what is most supportive to you. So with the, el- with the older people, they weren't doing the kettlebell lifting. They were just doing the warm up and, okay. or just the more, I've got so many people that literally every day, all they log in for is the sub 10 minute morning routine, which has a core temperature warm up, a spine warm up, and a few minutes of breathing, usually one to three breathing exercises. That may be all they do until they reach a level of, of health and vitality and body awareness to where the training would actually be supportive. You know, exercise like anything is going to be a prescription. Sometimes, you know, done correctly with good technique, it could still send someone, send someone into a state of excess or a state of depletion or deficiency. So again, we need to understand where we're at and at what level of intensity and at what level of movement might be supportive. And it might just be the warm up. Do that for a few months or do that for a week. And then, you know, get into the, the more loaded stuff. So depending on what you choose to do, it can be for anybody. So your first step is awareness, because if you are tired, stressed, you've had a bad night to sleep, you better be aware. Second is intention. What do you want to do out of the workout? Because that comes out of an assessment or awareness assessment of what's going on in terms of how you can push yourself. And then thirdly, people might be listening to this at the gym or they've been lifting weights for a while. I want to know what Mike Salemi's sort of breath work is. He comes up, he's just about to pick up the weight. Do you breathe in through your nose? Do you breathe out through your nose while you do it? We've done a lot of breathwork podcasts. Patrick McEwen coming on, doing two shows as well. We've had quite a few people just comment on how important breathing is. It's been a game changer for a lot of people, nasal breathing wise, even with my you know, cardio, my running, trying to breathe through my nose, in through my nose, out through my nose. It, it's been 2020 was the year of the breath for myself and many others. Mm-hmm. What is your specific way you breathe when you're just about to pick up that kettlebell or you're going to pick up a heavy weight? So it does depend on a few factors. So one, it depends on the load that I'm lifting, the repetitions that I'm doing, also the style. Most people don't realize with a kettlebell specifically, there's, and there's a bunch of nuances within this, but there's two primary styles of kettlebell lifting when we're looking at the swing, the clean, and the snatch. So the, the more like ballistic type movements. One is going to be more fast and explosive. That's what most people are very familiar with. It's a hinge based style. It looks like basically like a rapid deadlift. That type of breath, when I'm lifting a kettlebell and I'm on the ground, I'm going to hike the bell up, depending on the load too. When I hike it up, there's a moment of breath holding. And then as I hit the acceleration phase, there's a partial pressurized exhalation breath. And then there's an inhale at the top as the bell floats. That's fast explosiveness. That's a breathing rhythm that I can keep stability in the spine. And so that I can keep that my core integrated and, and, and basically solid so that I can explode to the, to the repetition. If I'm doing a kettlebell sport type set, so something longer, something more endurance space, the breathing needs to change. And there's a few breathing rhythms. Typically there's three breathing rhythms at the most simple level, at the most simple level, I'm going to exhale as the bell swings down and I'm going to inhale as the bell comes up. That's more anatomical breathing. That's as the spine extends, as we open up the rib cage open, we inhale as the bell goes down, we exhale more endurance. But basically now this might sound a little confusing. uh, And if I did it live, it would make more sense. But basically when I compete or when I'm doing a hard long set, I come, I do a breathing rhythm that combines both of those. So one where we can get more stability in the spine, but also one where we can take more rhythmic oxygen throughout to basically keep me going. And so basically what it is, is as the bell swings down, uh, there's a partial exhale. So I'm not exhaling everything to where I lose the, the stiffness in the spine. As the bell swings forward, there's the second half of that exhale and it's a little bit more forceful. So it's a partial down, partial exhale forward, And then as the bell swings at the top, my spine's extended. That's when I inhale. (laughs) So it's, it's, it's a little bit intricate, but if I, if you were standing right next to me, I could basically teach you in five minutes just by breathing next to you and getting you in sync with me, but it's a beautiful breathing rhythm. Um, all that said, 
98% of all my training nowadays, unless I'm doing a very hard comp or very hard effort, everything is nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. Everything has switched to that. And that in and of itself was one of the big things that I would say when you were asking what, what would, uh, you know, what's the percentage of, if I knew then what I knew now (laughs) breathing in the last three ish years, my knowledge of it has just skyrocketed. And the main, the big thing has been the nasal breathing component, as you mentioned, sleeping with mouth tape, nasal breathing, basically raising my, my, my threshold in all training so that I can work at nasal breathing intensity. That's been a massive change. So that 20% conservative improvement in performance just from nasal breathing. Okay. But generally, if someone's lifting the weight, they generally, you want to exhale through the nose as you're pushing it out. I mean, I know there's this part that you were saying, if you've got a day, you want to push things, you want to push boundaries out, you want to breathe out as you're pushing it. If you want to pull towards you and open up and receive and get, there's that emotional part. Does that go with the breathing as well? Or is it every time you push a weight, you want to make sure you're holding your breath and push and breathing out as you push it? So there can be that emotional component. There, there is the, there is the, the emotional component is absolutely present, whether we're aware of it or not, that's another thing, right? Uh, and that comes into the intentionality component, but basically with every, so any movement, any movement, and this is just for, for general health, well being, and performance, but anytime the body is coming out of the fetal position. So when the spine is extending, basically when you're moving, moving an abduction and external rotation, So think about like a clean, you're basically doing that. The breath should be inhale on the way up. And then anytime you're going into the fetal position, flexion, internal rotation, adduction, that's going to be exhalation. The only time, so like basically when you do a push, so if I'm pushing and if I continued that movement, I would start moving into the fetal position. So as I push, I exhale. As I pull, I'm moving out of the fetal position. I'm opening, I'm expanding. Wow. That's my inhale. And that rule and, and certain there's upper extremity movements and lower extremity movements. And sometimes there is some exceptions to the rule, but as a whole, that's the rule. However, once the load passes what we call the stabilization threshold in general, as a rule of thumb, now, again, there's always exceptions. It's typically anything above like 60% of your one rep max or if you can do, um, sometimes it's 18 repetitions. It depends on the, on the tool, the movement, some sort of stuff. There's some nuances, but if you're lifting an especially, especially heavy weight where the, the, the priority becomes spinal stabilization over respiration, then you're going to need to utilize some type of breath holding strategy or pressurized breath. Like I was talking about where I'm not letting it all out, but I am maintaining some pressure in the system. So again, like that's kind of breathing and performance is like a dial, right? If the weight's very light and we're doing like what I teach in kettlebell lifestyle that I learned from Paul check, working in exercises, active meditation exercises. These are movements that integrate breath with movement that are designed to cultivate energy in the body where technique is not really an issue. We're looking, looking to pump and energize basically it's body weight. And we're doing this for high repetitions. It's active meditation. I'm not going to hold my breath during that, but anytime I open, I inhale, I close, I exhale. But if you put 300 pounds on the bar on a deadlift, for example, I'm going to get to the bottom. I'm going to take a big breath in through the nose or through the mouth, hold my breath, pressurize my, basically my, my belly cavity pressurize. And I'm going to hold the breath as I go up. And then depending on the number of repetitions and the load, I might hold it all the way to the top. Or if it's a very long lift, like I'm really grinding, I may have to partially exhale as I come up basically through pursed lips. I would hold it off the floor. Once I get close to the knee, then I would because I'm still maintaining the pressure, but I don't want to pass out. If I held my breath so long and the, and the, and the movement took a few seconds, I could pass out, which I don't really want. Yeah. So. 
Geez, that is fascinating because people don't teach people how to breathe when they're doing different types of exercises, different types of weights. I mean, this is fundamentally important in terms of understanding how to breathe the different types of, you know, functional training or kettlebells or heavy weights on bench and that. I think probably, do you go through this in your program, the lifestyle program? Do you speak about it? Do you show people with the rhythm of the breathing and how important that is? Breathing is like, it's a part of every single, every single program from the morning routines to creating that awareness and that opening, making sure your TVA, like all that stuff, breathing in 3d it's in every program. I do have more advanced programs. So I've got one called mastering the kettlebell. That one's basically like, you could think of it like two or three certifications in one, uh, that goes over assessments for kettlebell lifting. I teach in depth, a breathing rhythm, basically for every type of lift, every style of lifting. Uh, it's like 400 videos. It's insane. Kettlebell mm-hmm. lifestyle is the actual complement to that. That's a workout program that is still very in depth, but breathing is absolutely like an integral part, uh, throughout the whole thing for sure. Brilliant. Do you use any sort of the aura ring in terms of recovery? As I've grown old, I've realized how important recovery is, you know, doing the cryotherapy, my infrared sauna here, you know, using things like peptides, I found being very, very beneficial. What are your thoughts on recovery as you've got older? And what are the hacks that you use to help your recovery? So at different stages in my life and competing, I've used different sorts of things. So I've, I've definitely used the aura ring. And also I work a lot with firefighters and we basically have the aura ring as part of their, their program basically. And so I teach them how to modify their training, utilizing the, the aura ring data at the end of the day, the overall goal, like we were talking about, like this whole conversation is how can we create greater levels of awareness and intentionality into our movement practice. So the aura ring or the, the whoop I've also used for an extended period of time, both are great forms of objective data, and those can really be helpful. When I was working with Paul, we used a super in-depth system, but it was much more subjective, I would say. Yeah. But trying to make some uh, objective data out of the subjective stuff. So I basically have questionnaires every day that I would fill out, rate and rank things like that were related to hormone imbalances, limbic emotional stress, muscle and joint soreness. And I would basically quantify those with different rating scales, put it in a summary chart. And I would have my own type of graph looking at heart rate, uh, looking at some of these different metrics. And I was creating the awareness that I could modify training. All that to say, I am a fan of the technologies, but typically only for a specific amount of time and or being willing to take a break from it. So for example, I don't believe my personal feeling, it's super supportive to wear it every single day for the rest of your life. I do believe that we should be able to have an internal meter inside of ourselves Mm -hmm. to not necessarily allow us or have us need an external cue or an external feedback to let us know if we're feeling good enough to train or good enough to, to push it that day or back off. If we can do that, but not depend on it and not be basically handcuffed by it, then it is supportive. But I remember when I was wearing my, I think it was, this was before the, when I was wearing the aura ring, I remember I went like on vacation or something like that, or was visiting a friend, left it at home. And I remember the amount of anxiety that I had in my chest when I was laying down, I was like, what, what am I going to do? I don't know what my readiness score is. I don't know what I slept. What? And then I was like, holy shit, Mike, like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. We need to take a step back. You've become too attached to the tech. And then I really started feeling like, okay, if I am going to use this, I need to use it more like intelligently and not use it as an empowering force as opposed to a disempowering force. Sure. Any hacks that you would recommend? Obviously, that's a fascinating way from an assessment to make sure that you're body aware, you're emotionally aware, you you know mentally aware of what's going on. What have been your top recovery hacks? Cold plunge, cold plunge and cold showers, huge. Sauna, absolutely huge. I've used both infrared and dry. Um, I personally, I mean, I, I like them both. Honestly, the most important thing is just getting the sauna in. So whatever that looks like, mm. I'm stoked with. But in my dry sauna, I actually train in my dry sauna. It's a, like a, a large uh, mm. six foot by eight foot. I can flip up the bench. So I'll actually train in there. That's been huge. Also a form of decompression type stretching that I, that I do and teach called the Eldoa. Uh, it's been very powerful. Like literally in one minute, the, 
one posture, one minute a day done every single day has given me so much changes. I do a few more than that, but absolutely huge. Um, man, sleep has been, it's not even a hack, but just like dark room, uh, slightly cool room, um, winding down early, just the, honestly, like I really do believe like hacks can be really important, but, or can be really helpful, but the foundations, like literally what I do believe that I do really well is like the meat and potatoes. Like that's what I do really well. Mm. Sleep, eating good, knowing where my food came from and or hunting my food now to drinking good quality water to breathing in and out through the nose to giving myself time each day to journal and work out, just have a freaking mind and heart dump on the paper before I go out in my day and basically start projecting that BS on others, like the foundations of what it is, the, the soil of what it is to make a healthy and whole person. Wow. That's what I really realized that I do really well. It's not always the sexiest thing, but when you add in things like the cold plunge, the sauna, you know, some good supplements, like I really love Symbiotica. It's one of the brands that I really loved now this last two years I've been using it. Like little things, she legit, those are all good things. But for me, those are like, like tweaks. little ratchets, tweaks. Those are tweaks. Those should not replace, not if you're not getting any sleep, you're sleeping at 2 a.m. every day. It doesn't matter how many cold plunges you do yeah. or what IV invec- injection you get. Uh, all that stuff doesn't really matter unless you basically focus on that. So this is a, a testament to really like the base foundations is how you build a solid house that can last. Mm. Brilliant. In terms of therapies, you know, I've done a lot of prototherapy and PRP injections over 26,000 sessions. You know, do you use acupuncture, massage, use cupping? What are the things that have been really beneficial for Mike? And, you know, you've obviously trained thousands of people. You've been in the game for a long time. What has worked for you and worked for your clients? The best things, honestly, has been the things that I've been able to do on myself. Because one of the things when I was competing, man, the vast majority of all my disposable income went to food and self-care therapies. Like basically I was getting a weekly massage, weekly acupuncture, cupping was in there. I was doing uh, neurosomatic therapy, um, working with a high level check practitioner, um, also doing mental emotional coaching with, with someone. So like working with Paul, like there was so much investment on all these things. And I think they're, they're great, but again, they're only tweaks to an already solid system acupuncture has been huge for me Hmm. and it's been huge for me in multiple different ways. One from just the hormonal balance, like with, with, especially when I was competing, that amount of output is a lot. And so to get me to, to have some support and down regulating and balancing myself, and I would use it super strategically. I would either every two weeks when I was training in kettlebell sport, we would do like not a maximum effort, but like, it would basically be like a test set. Every two weeks would be in the cycle. You would push it and we would cycle it like that. So depending on how I was feeling, I would either have it like basically acupuncture the day before or basically the day of or the day after to basically upregulate or downregulate. But then also too, is like, as you're super familiar, I'm sure little niggles and injuries and tweaks when you're doing the type of volume that we're doing and you're doing the level of consistency, things are going to arise. And so acupuncture was huge and just like little things like my shoulder, maybe my knee or my back gets into a bad spot, but acupuncture has been huge. Fantastic. Now, Mike, what is the follow through on your course? I mean, I know these online, uh, I much prefer in person, you know, trainers that I've used over the years or functional training, you know, I'm going to take this program on. I'm committed to doing it. I've got some kettlebells, you know, now it's obviously online. How do you find people's follow through and have they kept it like six months later? Does it become part of a lifestyle? Yeah, maybe not the whole thing becomes a part of a lifestyle for people, but based off of what resonated most with them, like I've got a lot of people, as I mentioned earlier, that are just doing still the morning routines or just the warm up, And then because it's a program designed to be completed with just one bell, again, it's more skill development and muscular endurance. Because I wanted to make sure that, especially during COVID when it came out, that someone didn't need to buy five or, or two sets of bells. When you're dealing with one weight, 
again, you're really dealing with how can I maximize skill and basically either get in more repetitions during a time frame. And so someone will absolutely get more fit. They'll get more, they're mobile. But if you're looking for like absolute strength and to really see how much you can squat, it's not the program for that. And so people based off of their different goals might cycle on and off. But even I've heard this so many times, even if they're doing another program following based off of a different goal, they still do the warm up or they still do the stretching. So, but that being said, my programs are absolutely not for everybody. It's really those who want to learn. Like I love teaching. I absolutely love teaching and mm -hmm. empowering people. So uh, there is a time investment for sure. And it really depends on what someone's looking to get out of it. You could use it, just go to the workouts and do those and, and knock them out. But that's really not how it was designed to be done. That being said, uh, those that want to learn and understand why they're doing what they're doing and to set up a longer process, those are the people that continue with it. And those are the people that get the most benefit from it. So it's not like, uh, like I said, it's not uh, uh, 20 minutes, kick your ass, you're on the floor sweating, but you will leave every single workout feeling better than when you walked in. And you will learn something about yourself and you will be more empowered with a kettlebell. So every program that you do after any time you touch a kettlebell, you'll have that understanding, that respect, you'll have earned your way into it. Um, and again, like it really depends on what someone's intentions are, but if they do want to learn and put in the time to investing in their body, people absolutely continue with it. Brilliant. And is it practical? You download it on your phone. You can go to the gym if you don't have a home gym or you can do it outside. Is it able that you just press and play a video pops up and then Mike's going to take you through a bunch of exercises if you don't have a kettlebell at home or you want to do it in the gym where other people are exercising? You can certainly do that. There is, it's not an app, but it is a mobile responsive basically program. And there's two, there's basically a beginner track an intermediate track. And then within those, there's two types of ways to follow. You could either do what I call the full immersion route where I've pre-programmed every day for you and you just follow the system. Or if you're a trainer, if you've got knowledge of just strength and conditioning, or for example, you're a shift worker and you want to take more basically control over your schedule. There's a self-guided route where you've got access to every phase, every workout. I do give you a recommendation PDF that gives you my suggestion on what to complete in each phase before moving on, what frequency I would suggest. But if you just want to get in and go, you can follow the self-guided route and you've got everything there that you can follow either on your phone or on your laptop. Brilliant. And just tell us about the future of kettlebells. Where's it going to, you know, where's the science in terms of kettlebells? What research has been done and what is exciting you in this space? So what's exciting me most in this space is how to utilize kettlebells in non-traditional ways. So how to utilize kettlebells for more rotational training, which most people don't associate kettlebells for how to utilize kettlebell with combining it with working in. So you have this really unique synergy of working out energy output movements with actually energy cultivating movements, how you integrate the kettlebell with another phenomenal tool like the Bulgarian bag, which I teach a lot of. So how do these tools, like every tool has its own personality, has its own flavor, has its own pros and cons and really understanding kettlebell. It's a phenomenal tool, but there's certain things it just can't do just like the barbell. Yeah. The Bulgarian bag, man, that tool was designed for rotation and putting you in positions, some of them that you simply just can't get into with a kettlebell. And so when you understand how they can complement each other, the grip with a Bulgarian bag, is very different than a kettlebell. It's more of a full grip, like a, like a grappler's grip. So that's what really excites me is how can I evolve how I've been taught the kettlebell and utilize it in a way that supports more of this movement mm. as medicine philosophy. So those are just some of the things that, yeah, that stoked me up right now. Brilliant. And what about blood flow modification? You know, we use Katsu. I've used Katsu for a long time. I find it incredibly benefit, not for every single session, but from a recovery point of view. And then obviously sometimes just giving my joints a bit of rest, putting more pressure on the muscles and then getting all the hormonal output like your growth hormone, your veg F1, your testosterone increase in those with blood flow modification. How do you see that in kettlebells? Man, that's a good question. I, I've only dabbled a little bit with that stuff and never honestly with kettlebells only there's a place called Vasper 
which yeah. I know they've like, they've been, so they're right next to me and my buddy works there or used to work there. Mm-hmm. So I would go there on their cardio equipment and get to experience a little bit of that. But honestly, that's, I don't have much experience. Okay. I would love to try some of the stuff with kettlebells. And I think it'd be fascinating. I do mm-hmm. think that it's definitely a direction that we will see some stuff going, but I haven't honestly put the reps in to really speak intelligently on it. Brilliant. Last question for the audience, Mike. Uh, there's been a lot of despair, a lot of pain out there, a lot of loss, a lot of suffering over this time worldwide. Uh, there is hope. There's a consciousness that's a collective consciousness that is growing. Give a message of hope in terms of movement and exercise. You know, they're calling the Corona 20, which is 20 pounds that the average person's put on, you know, in eight years time. I had Dr. Pearl Mutter you know, the neurologist said that 50% of Americans will be obese by 2030. There's some real crazy stats out there in terms of health and wellness. Uh, a message of hope and, and how you see the light, uh, you know, with regards to movement and health in, in a crazy, crazy world. Yeah, I love the philosophy of essentialism. Are you familiar with that at all? Yeah. It's, it's the philosophy of just less but better. Yeah. And I believe we can apply that to so many areas in our life from just the relationships we have to the information that we choose to read to the podcast we choose to listen to. Because all of those forms, again, if, if movement is life and movement extends far beyond just physical movement, mental, emotional, spiritual, everything we have coming in is either going to be pushing us further towards our dream and our goals and our purpose or pulling us away from it. And so for me, like less but better. And with movement specifically, it doesn't need to look like anything insurmountable. And I hope if anybody, whether it's through my program or through any program that anybody does, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes, it is so important to just do, just, just do it. Just do it. Even if it's one minute of a breathing exercise of you just breathing in and out through your nose that's how we start creating a momentum of positive effort and pot. Like that's how we create a snowball effect. And if you can do even as little as five minutes of anything for your health, whether it's breathing or drinking some water, right. When you wake up or going out for a walk as little as getting outside for five minutes, if you're in your desk and office all day, that in and of itself, one is a major service to your body and your health and your mindset But once again, that's why they always say, what's the first thing you should do in the morning is do your bed, right? Why? Because you start creating this cascade of achievement and and momentum that you can carry into other activities. So less but better doesn't need to be much. Just get something in of anything that we discussed or anything that people are learning from your podcast would be huge. Brilliant. What an inspiring message of hope. And we declare favor and blessing over you, Mike. And thank you for your programs. Thank you for your calling. Your absolute like uh, purpose in helping people, transforming people's lives through breath work, through movement, to intentionality, into essentialism. So I really want to thank you. Uh, I've, I'm looking forward to doing the program. I'm looking forward to hopefully just spreading it out in uh, in Africa. Where can people connect with you? I'll follow you on Instagram. Maybe you can give your handle, your website, just where people can get hold of Mark. Yeah, the, the best place, Instagram is just my name, Mike, but dot Salemi. Website is mikesalemi.io, not dot com. On there, you can sign up for my newsletter list. I send basically create new videos each week for YouTube on kettlebells and other aspects. You can see all the different programs I have working with me on breath work, whether it's through, for example, like Patrick McEwen's oxygen advantage type work for performance and recovery and function. Or on the more trauma side, I teach um, and I lead people through somatic release breath work. So all of that stuff is on my site. And um, feel free to reach out anytime. Anybody who's interested in a program or just wants to get in touch, Instagram is also just the, the best place probably to reach out directly to me. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you, brother. I Brilliant. appreciate it, man. This was cool. fun. Thank you.